volumetric flask. This is a 250.00 milliliter volumetric flask. Uh, there's going to be an etch mark. You can't really see it in this picture, but it's somewhere along the net. Depends on, they'll fill this with fluid and calibrate it. Um, this is solid potassium dichromate that they're having. And so we have chromate, which is more orange, and dichromate, which is more yellow. And so they have this, it looks like a filter paper, and they're just transferring it. It's hard to transfer solids into something like this with a long neck here, but you can wash in the solid to transfer it quantitatively. And then they're mixing it. They don't mix it when it's full, it's hard to mix when it's full. And then they're topping it off with a dropper ball here so they don't overshoot the mark. It looks like the mark is right around here. If they overshoot it, then they'll have to discard this and start over again. It's potassium dichromate. A solution dilution equation. Like I said, some people use this equation in titrations, but it doesn't, it's not really correct. You know, the units don't really work out. If you're ever taking the more concentrated, and then just adding water to the blue to a lower concentration. Here's a solution dilution process. And so we have a dilution bagger, so we'll pipette some liquid in here and dilute it. So if this is a 25 milliliter pipette, 25 milliliter diluted to 250 would be a dilution factor of 1 to 10. You know, one part of concentrated to 10 parts of dilute. <coughs> so this should be 1 tenth the original concentration, whatever the original concentration was. But that's solution dilution. All right, so we have uh, two more sections to cover. One is a limiting reagent. This is a pretty standard in intro chem. Um, there's not much difference in chem 1A. Do you guys remember doing these type of problems? Limiting reactant, excess reactant problems? Yes, no? Yeah, okay. <coughs> So I'm not going to talk much about it. I like to do it, you know, the, there's two different methods that people use. They use the comparison of moles and um, the smaller amount. I like to use the smaller amount method. And so let's say to make uh, these packets, we need a title page. And so how many packets can we make? 87 packets. And we need an instruction page. But the instruction page, we only have 83. So the, with 83 instruction pages, we can only make 83 packets, therefore that's the smaller amount, you know, 87 packets versus 83 packets. So 83 packets would be called the theoretical yield, and the instruction sheet would be called the limiting reactant, and the title page would be called the excess reactant, and we have some leftover. We have four leftover title pages. And so this is pretty much a standard Chem 4 type limiting reactant problem. In Chem 1A, um, we don't limit ourselves just to two reactants. Sometimes we'll have three reactants in there. And so this you know, A plus B plus C, and either one of those could be the limiting reactant. So if we have one more reactant here, let's say data sheets, how many data sheets do we need? We need two data sheets per packet. And so we could do a comparison of amounts, you know, but I like to do the limiting uh, excuse me, the limiting region by the smaller amount. And so this gives 87 packets, this gives 83 packets, 168 data sheets. We need two data sheets per packet. So that means um, we can form 84. Is that correct? 84 packets. So the limiting is still the instruction sheet here. Um, but we'll have some excess data sheets left over. However, um, let's say we had four reactants, A plus B plus C plus D, then you know, we just look at it, just extra steps. So we need graph paper. How many graph papers do we need? We need four sheets of graph paper per packet. And so um, 328 divided by four sheets per packet gives what? 82. 82. So um, this, the graph paper only allows us to make 82 packets, so really 
the theoretical yield would be about 82 packets, this is a smaller amount, and the limiting reactant would be the graph paper. So it's pretty much the same. Um, just you might have more reactants, you might not. That's it. And then we have the theoretical yield. The theoretical yield is based on limiting reactant. The limiting reactant dictates what theoretical yield you get. Let's say you get tired, you know, after 40 packets. Let's say, what was it, 82? After 41 packets, you get tired and you stop there. You know, even though in the theoretical yield was 82 packets, you only made 41. And so 41 would be the actual yield. Step tire of making the packet. And therefore, the percent yield would be what? If there was enough material to make 82, but you only made 41, then your percent yield would be 50%. All right, so take, take a look. I, I signed some limiting reactant problems. Um, pretty much standard type of calculation. Sometimes your percent yield is not because um, you didn't finish it. Sometimes the percent yield is, um, is limited due to things like simultaneous reactions. Simultaneous reactions are like, um, let's say somebody else needs some of the graph paper. And so you need the graph paper to make your packets, but somebody else needs their graph paper for the homework. That would be a simultaneous reaction. So both of you are competing for the graph paper. And that's going to limit, limit the yield potentially. So sometimes, uh, sometimes your actual yield is, is less due to simultaneous reactions occurring. But you know, if we know the simultaneous reactions, then uh, we can anticipate those and lower our theoretical yield. So that's not a major factor. I just kind of so what we're going to talk about are consecutive um, reactions, consecutive simultaneous and overall reactions. And so in multi-step synthesis, we're going to have consecutive steps. So um, in the multi-step synthesis, we might start off with um, converting um, copper into this. And then in the next step, we convert that into something else, et cetera. So those would be consecutive reactions. So this might be something new that you haven't encountered before. So we're going to talk a little bit about this here. Um, when we have these consecutive reactions, we form intermediate products. So let's say we go from A to B to C to D. You know, B, C might be intermediates, and A would be the initial reactant, and D would be the final product. And so intermediates are these products that are produced in the middle steps. And the overall reaction would be you know, what you start with A and the final step um, product, which would be D in the, in the example I gave you. So we'll come back to that um, by looking at some example problems for that. Uh, the last section in, the, in chapter four is the extent of reaction. Extent of reaction is like, okay, what was the extent of reaction? If I could produce 82 packets, but I only produced 41, I kind of got tired. I didn't want to make any more packets. I only completed, what, 50% of the packets, right? That would be the extent of reaction. That was the extent of my reaction. That's, you know, at the end of that, I was tired. I didn't want to make any more. And so I only had a 50%. Well, um, This is the going to be the uh, extent of, this is kind of normalized here. The extent of reaction is, sometimes these reactions do not go all the way. Sometimes, you know, when, when we have lithium, like say this is lithium oxide, and we heat it up and it de decomposes into these lithium oxide. What is this? Lithium peroxide. This is lithium peroxide solid, decomposes into lithium oxide solid plus oxygen. And so if we start off with, let's say, 100 grams of lithium peroxide, typically we'd, we'd expect all 100 grams of lithium peroxide to be decomposed into lithium oxide and, and oxygen gas. And that's normally what we predict. You know, we would predict complete reaction. But 
in this case, we're only going to have partial reaction, and the partial reaction can be due to different things. Maybe we didn't heat it long enough or hot enough, you know, just ran out of steam, or uh, or there could be um, other you know side reactions or whatnot occur. And so, in this particular example here, um, you know, we started off with 0.0911 moles. And how much did we lose? Well, we lost 0 0.07 of that. So it's around 70%, a little less than 70%, or a little more than 70% reaction here. And so the symbol that we give, this is the extent of reaction, is this weird symbol. Do you see this weird symbol here? That's the extent of reaction. So the extent of reaction can be however much. And so it's a partial reaction. Uh, we're going to see that come up later. So we don't lose all of it. For some reason, we don't lose all of it. We only lose some of it in the extent of reaction. This is a normalized extent of reaction here. Delta n the moles uh, equal to the coefficient here two times the extent of the reaction. That's how many moles we lose. Um, we're not going to worry too much about this just yet. You know, just know that there's something called the extent of reaction, kind of where you could have reacted all of it, but you didn't, and therefore, you know, what amount was reacted? This would be the amount that's reacted. So let's take a look at Some examples of consecutive reactions that go. All right, so in this simultaneous reaction, the way we handle these is um, we just look at these independently, um, but they are connected. And so let's take a look at this. recording.
And so these are simultaneous reactions. These happen at the same time. What we don't do with simultaneous reactions is we don't sum them up. You know, so for example, both of these are happening in, at the same time. We don't do this. So, oops, we um, undo that. Try to draw a straighter line here. So a tendency uh, of some people is to combine these. So they want to know the total hydrochloric acid. So why not just add these two equations? So if we go magnesium hydroxide um, plus magnesium carbonate plus altogether four HCLs yields magnesium chloride, and we have two of those, plus three H2Os, plus CO2. And uh, <clears throat> the reason we don't combine these like this, unless we have additional information, is because of this. What's the stoichiometric ratio between magnesium hydroxide and magnesium carbonate? What's the ratio? It's a one to one. And so that means you have a one to one mole ratio between magnesium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide. So that means when you go out to weigh the magnesium carbonate, you need to weigh out one mole of magnesium carbonate. How much does one mole magnesium carbonate weigh? Well, let's do that since we've got to figure out the um, <clears throat> molar masses anyway. So magnesium weighs 24.31. Glare like that. It's hard to see. 24.31. Carbon weighs. Anybody? Three oxygens weighs 4800. And so the molar mass of this is going to be 32. And over here, I'm going to add um, 6, 10, 14, 2, 5, 9432, is that correct? All right. So if I have a mole of magnesium carbonate, how much does that weigh? It weighs 94.32 grams, right? How much does a mole of magnesium hydroxide weigh? Well, uh, is it 8432? Okay, thanks. 8432. How much does a mole of magnesium hydroxide weigh? Um, let's figure that out. So magnesium is 2431. Um, two oxygens would be 3200, and two hydrogens would be 202. So it's going to be 33 and um, 8 and 5833. Is that correct? Oh, you guys good? So in order to do this reaction, in this ratio, I need to take 84.32 grams of magnesium hydroxide and mix that with 58.33 grams, oh, backwards, 84.32 grams of magnesium carbonate and mix that with 58.33 grams of magnesium hydroxide, and that will give me a one-to-one -one mole ratio, correct? However, When you make a mixture, does the mixture always have to be a one-to-one -one mole ratio, or can I have a little bit more or a little bit less? So everything, let's say, if you mix sugar and flour, do you have to mix that in a one-to-one -one mole ratio? That is, you always need one mole of this and one mole of that, or can you mix sugar and flour in any ratio you want? You can mix it in any ratio you want. And the same thing goes with magnesium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide. You can mix those two in any ratio you want. However, when you combine the equations like this, now you're telling me you can't mix these in any ratio you want. 
you can only mix them in a one to one mole ratio. Is that correct? No, and so don't do this. Don't do this. This is wrong. This fixes the mixture composition. And now the, uh, the only way this works, you know, to be four moles of HCl is how much HCl we consume. Is the only way this works is if this is in a one to one mole ratio. If it's not in a one to one mole ratio, then it doesn't necessarily work. And so even though these are simultaneous reactions, we keep them separate. <clears throat> we keep them separate because that allows us to make any ratio we want. So for example, if I want only half a mole of magnesium hydroxide, it's no big deal. A half a mole plus one mole of HCl plus a half, this would yield a half a mole of this and one mole of water. Or a quarter mole, or one eighth of a mole, or 0.039 moles, you know? We'll get that. Whatever I want. And the same thing with magnesium carbonate. I could use whatever I want. And so the ratio would be whatever you know I have here for magnesium, whatever I have here for magnesium carbonate, magnesium hydroxide, magnesium carbonate. This so um, in reality, this is a pretty straightforward problem because we treat it as two separate stoichiometry problems and then add the combined HCl at the end. And so what we do is we just look at the HCl con consumed by reaction, um, the first reaction, let's say. HCl consumed by magnesium hydroxide. So we'll just do a stoichiometry problem with that. And so we have a total of 425 grams of mixture. So we go 425 grams of mix. And then they tell us the percent composition of the mixture. It's 30, no, 64.8 percent. So this is 64.8 grams of magnesium hydroxide per 100 grams of mix. So that gives us grams of magnesium hydroxide. And then from grams of magnesium hydroxide, we'll go to moles of magnesium hydroxide by using the molar mass. And then from moles of magnesium hydroxide, we'll go to moles of HCl. It's a one to two mole ratio. And then from moles of HCl, we'll go to grams of HCl. So this gives us the grams of HCl consumed by magnesium hydroxide. And then we'll look at the HCl consumed by magnesium carbonate. And so, again, just another 425 grams of mix. And then we're going to go to grams of magnesium carbonate. And then to moles of magnesium carbonate. And then from moles of magnesium carbonate to moles of HCl to grams of HCl. So if I take the grams of HCl consumed by the magnesium hydroxide plus the grams of HCl consumed by the magnesium carbonate, this gives me the total grams of HCl consumed. And so I just combine these. But I don't come I, I just do the two separate equations. So the mole ratio here comes from the original equation. The mole ratio here is two moles of HCl per mole of magnesium hydroxide. And that came from the original equation here. Two moles of HCl per one mole of magnesium hydroxide. And the mole ratio down here came from this, two moles of HCl per one mole of magnesium carbonate. Which came from here, one mole of magnesium carbonate, two moles of HCl. And so we treat those separately. I'm not going to finish it, the calculation. I'm just going to show this out. Is this enough? So 
we look at 84, how many grams of CO2 are produced from the leak combustion of 406 grams of a bottle of gas that consists of 72.7% propane and 27.3% butane by mass? When I look at this problem, it's exactly the same as the last problem, except maybe one step more difficult. And so, take a look at this particular problem. So I have uh, two simultaneous equations. Both of them are combustion. So I'm going to have propane. I like to write propane like this. Um, CH3, CH2, CH3. Um, that way I avoid isomers. You know, if I have the condensed structural formula like this, it's more informative than the molecular formula, C3H8 here. That's propane. Butane would be uh, CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. There are isomers for C4H10. Butane's one of them. Another is methylpropane, et cetera. So uh, this one's more complicated because they don't give us the reaction, but we should know combustion reactions. So let's look at a combustion reaction here. C3H8 plus what for combustion? Yields what? Yeah. So we'll have to balance this. And so balancing this, we have three carbons, three carbons here, eight hydrogens, we'll need four waters. And then I look at the oxygens on the product side. So I have three times two is six, plus four is ten, ten oxygens. That means O2 has to be five to give me ten oxygens. All right, then we do the states. Propane, solid, liquid, or gas? Propane's a gas. Oxygen? CO2? H2O? Liquid. And so this is the combustion reaction for propane. The other component of the mixture is butane. Butane is C4H10. In organic chemistry, they have a pattern. Now, this pattern is this. If we look at the carbons, and we go, that, we call that N. So N is equal to 3. We do 2N. So 2 times 3 is 6. And then we do plus 2. 2N plus 2. So 2 times 3, 6 plus 2 gives us 8. And so when we have a 2N plus 2 hydrocarbon like this, it's an alkane. This, is this a 2N plus 2? 2? 2 times 4 is? 8 plus 2 is 10. So both of these are 2n plus 2. 2n plus 2s all have single bonds. If we have an alkene, it's just a 2n. And so if this were had a double bond, it'd be C3H6. If there's a triple bond in there, it'd be C3H4, you know, 2n minus 2. And so there's little patterns here and there that people use in organic chemistry. How about C4H10, solid, liquid, or gas? Butane is the dividing line. You know, methane is a gas. Ethane is a gas. Propane is a gas. But when we hit butane, butane switches to a liquid. And then as we go on bigger, like pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, those are all liquids. And then when we get to very large, carbon chains, like 20 carbons, those become solid. So when we combust um, butane, uh, we combust it in oxygen, we're going to form CO2 and water. So let's balance this here. We'll need four CO2s, five waters. So that's going to be four times two is eight plus 5 is 13. So I have 13 oxygens on the right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just call this 13 halves. So if I have uh, 13 halves, 7 and a half times 2, that's going to give me 13 oxygens here. 
And then what I can do is double everything. So let's go ahead and double everything here. So that's going to give me two butanes plus 13 oxygens yields four CO2 plus five H2O. So these are my um, two equations here. So what I want to do is I want the total CO2. Uh-huh. Uh, maybe I forgot to. Yes, I did. I forgot to. 8 and then 10. Okay. So even though I want the uh, total combined CO2, I'm going to treat these as two separate stoichiometry problems. And so I have 406 grams of mixture, and I know the um, composition of the mixture, how much propane, 72.7%. And so I'd start off with 406 grams of mix, and then I'm going to go to grams of propane, to moles of propane, to moles of CO2. The moles of CO2 I'm going to get from the propane equation, and that's three moles of CO2 per mole of propane. And so the conversion factor here is three moles of CO2 per one mole of propane. And then I'm going to go to grams of CO2. And so this is the CO2 from propane. And then I'm going to do a completely separate stoichiometry problem to calculate the CO2 from butane. And so this is going to be 406 grams of mix. And then from there, I'll use the percent composition to get the grams of butane. And then go to moles of butane, to moles of CO2, to grams of CO2. And this is going to have a different mole ratio. This is 8 moles of CO2 per 2 moles of butane. So 8 moles CO2 per 2 moles of butane. OK, the composition is different. They tell us the composition up here. It's 72.7 propane. And then for butane, it's going to be the balance. So 27.3%. We just convert that into a fraction. Which would be 72.7 grams of propane per 100 grams of mix. All right. Once we get the CO2 from the propane and the CO2 from the butane, we just add them. So we'll just combine these two. And this is going to equal the total CO2. All right, so this is another example of simultaneous reaction. We have two simultaneous reactions. We're burning the propane and the butane simultaneously. And we're going to have a combined uh, product, CO2. Is that okay? Let me know if you want me to work it out more, just setting it up. Dichloro, dichloro methane. If you take a methane molecule, how many hydrogens does methane have? Four. And, um, Let's take a methane molecule and remove two of the hydrogens and replace it with chlorines. So that's dichloro. 
and then we'll take the remaining two hydrogens and replace those with fluorines. That's difluoro. So difluoro, difluoro, methane is like a methane stripped of all its hydrogens, and it's replaced with two chlorines and two fluorines. So this would be dichloro, difluoro, methane, methane being one carbon organic. Dichloro difluoromethane was once widely used as a refrigerant. It's had widespread use. It's um, called CFC. Do you know what CFC stands for? CFC? Like Freon. CFC. CFC stands for chlorofluorocarbons. Um, CFCs have long since been banned in the U.S. They don't use CFCs anymore in the U.S. And in fact, I think that it's banned in all Western countries, CFCs are. But why? Because um, carbon-chlorine bonds are very strong and carbon-fluorine bonds are very strong. And so CFCs are, one of the um, properties of CFCs are they're pretty much non-toxic. At least that's the way the thinking goes. They're not. Is nitrogen toxic? Have you ever thought about that? If nitrogen were toxic, we'd be in a lot of trouble because it's in the air, it's in the air at 80%. 80% 80 of the air is nitrogen. So what makes nitrogen so non-toxic? Well, it's, it would be toxic if there was no oxygen, but that's not due to nitrogen. Let's do the lack of oxygen. But what makes nitrogen so non-toxic is because it's got strong bonds. You know, um, when you look at a nitrogen molecule, you know, it's not a single, it's not a double. What, what, what's the bond in a nitrogen molecule? It's a triple bond. The triple bond's strong, like a thousand kilojoules per mole strong. And so the bond is very hard to break, making nitrogen nitrogen gas very unreactive you know you need some like catalyst you know certain legumes have catalysts catalysts have you heard of catalysts before yeah they make things like bond breaking a little easier well um well anyway cfc's have very strong bonds and so these were thought to be pretty non-toxic and um cfc's are they flammable and when I ask you if something's flammable, we need an oxidizer and we need a fuel, like propane. Propane's a good fuel, butane's a good fuel. What makes a good fuel a good fuel? What makes a good fuel a good fuel is being electron rich. And what makes a good oxidizer a good oxidizer is being electron poor. And so what we look for, or we look for electron rich species, like methane. Is methane electron rich or electron poor? So when we look at methane, I look at the carbon here, and I look for the oxidation state on carbon. What is the oxidation state on carbon in methane? Well, hydrogen always gets an oxidation state of what? Well, not always. But hydrogen's oxidation state is going to be plus one. So hydrogen's plus one, that means carbon is Minus four. So uh, minus four is that on the rich end of the carbon spectrum? What does the carbon spectrum go from? You know, goes from minus four to plus four. So it's on the rich end. Do you see that? So methane is an excellent fuel. It's quite electron rich. How about um, dichloro dichloromethane? Is that something that's a good fuel? So let's take a look at the carbon in dichloro dichloromethane. The carbon is, well, which one would get its electrons first, chlorine or fluorine? Both of these bond electrons. Which one's stronger, do you think, fluorine or chlorine? How about electronegativity? You remember that? Which one has a higher electronegativity, chlorine or fluorine? Yeah, fluorine, fluorine's strong. So fluorine, 
chlorine gets it minus one, so minus two, then chlorine minus one, two of them, that's minus two. That means carbon is plus four. Carbon is a plus four. Does it have any more electrons it could lose? Could it go to plus five, plus six? No. And so this is not flammable. You can't burn the stuff. And so it's non-flammable. And it's got strong bonds, so it's fairly non-toxic. So this was an excellent refrigerant, and this is why it was, it was in widespread use. Because here you have a refrigerant. If it leaks out into your house, you don't have to worry about poisoning yourself, right? And um, you don't have to worry about anything catching on fire. Now, the current batch of refrigerants, a lot of them are flammable, so you have to be careful, but they use very little. So if there were a fire, it's not going to be a huge fire, you know. But some of them are, like, quite flammable. And so they were looking at using, um, at least when I was doing some research, they were looking at using chlorofluorocarbons as artificial blood. Have you ever heard of that? I don't know what they're using now. They're using other stuff for artificial blood. So let's see. It would just be the fluid part. You'd need other stuff in artificial blood, things to carry oxygen and CO2. But at one time, I remember that chlorofluorocarbons were thought to be a potential candidate because of their non-toxic unreactive behavior. There are other things that are being looked at for artificial blood now. And so here's one candidate came up. Blood substitutes. Okay. But CFCs are no longer used in refrigerants. And that's uh, due to some work there at UC Irvine. Uh, this is a Nobel Prize winning uh, chemistry professor there, Roland. I, I went to a couple of his talks when he was talking about this. Um, this is one of these unintended consequences. You know, something looks so promising. You know, non-toxic, non-flammable. You know, what, what could go wrong with that? You know, this is one of those unforeseen things. People didn't realize that. And so what, what had happened, you know what CFCs are blamed for? CFCs are blamed for ozone depletion. And so this is a reaction that they didn't anticipate. You know, and there are cases of this. The CFCs, they leak, leak out of your refrigerator, and they, they aren't going to kill you. They aren't going to catch on fire. But what happens is they float up high up into the atmosphere and then wreak havoc on the ozone layer. And so the UV, what ha they didn't know this at the time, but the UV light hits the CFCs, breaks off the fluorines, breaks off the chlorines, and creates things called free radicals. And these free radicals attack the ozone and end up depleting it. So nowadays we have to wear um, much more sunscreen. You know, back when I was growing up, you know, if you didn't put on sunscreen, it wasn't that big of a deal. You didn't come back all red and sunburned. But nowadays, it's yeah, the UV is much more intense. So so anyway, let's go back to this problem here. So this can be prepared by the reactions shown. All right, this is not an example of simultaneous. This is an example of consecutive reaction. In a consecutive reaction, we have to do the first step in order to do the second step. So the first step is the production of this. Do you know the name of this, CCL4? And also, there are other things. 
these CFCs were thought to be wonderful, you know. Um, they're used for lots of different things, like flame retardants, you know, fire. And now, yeah, have you heard, heard about all this, uh, the PFAS stuff? Have you heard of PFAS? PFAS are now banned, but they used to be thought as, uh, as being okay. Well, in California, this is just recent. And basically, these are these organics that contain fluorine, like Teflon. You know, Teflon is this wonder coating that has very strong carbon fluorine bonds, and it's non flammable, right? Even though it's got carbon. And um, it forms a great non-stick coating, so a lot of people have Teflon-coated pans. But they use Teflon for lots of other things, too, you know, as uh, uh, lots of different applications. And so anyway, right now in, in California, uh, this took effect last year, the use of PFAS in food packaging has been banned. They used to use it in food packaging because you, if you have paper packaging and you coat it with PFAS, it doesn't absorb water. They have clothing that they coated with PFAS, so it doesn't absorb water. My, my pants are probably coated in PFAS because I spilled some coffee on there and I was worried. Uh, the co and it just uh, took a napkin and, and wiped it up and didn't even see any spots from the coffee. And so I thought, man, my pants must have PFAS. But I, I, it hasn't been banned yet in clothing, but I think it's just a matter of time. I think in 2025 it's supposed to be banned in clothing. Yeah. In 2025 I can't buy these pants anymore. So when I spill coffee on them, oh well, they're going to get stained but until I wash them. So that'll be in 2025. By 2030, you know, the forever chemicals, these are forever chemicals, the CFCs are the forever chemicals, you know. Uh, we're going to prohibit the use of these. You know, so what, what changed, you know? All of a sudden, these wonder chemicals are now not so wonderful anymore, you know? Didn't they know everything already? And that, that's, that's like, no, uh, science is actually when you get into um, modeling real world stuff, it becomes more complicated. And so you have to have, you know, if there are things that could lead to unexpected consequences. And so, I mean, anything real world is, going to be more complex. But any, anyway, getting back to this, this is uh, carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tetrachloride is a mutagen. I think it's also a carcinogen. So even though it does look like a uh, stable forever chemical, um, we use it sometimes. So you just try to avoid contact. It's a liquid. It's a heavy liquid. And it's quite nonpolar. So um, it's like oil and water, except this oil is very dense. It seeps to the bottom. And we're actually using it in the lab for this next series of experiments. What, what lab are we doing? Do you know what lab we're doing tomorrow? What? 17? 17? 16. 16 something? Yeah. A series of labs, like starting with, I think, with 12, where we're looking at chemical reactions. So we're going to be using chloroform, carbon tetrachloroform, but not chloroform. Um, we are going to be using chloroform, not carbon tetrachloride. Sorry. Chloroform has one hydrogen, three chlorine. Well, anyway, getting back to this. this We need to do this first to produce the carbon tetrachloride. This carbon tetrachloride is used in the second step here, where it reacts with HF. So these are um, consecutive reactions, not simultaneous reactions. So we have to do the first reaction in order to get the second reaction. And so what do we do for stoichiometry with something like this? So what they want is how many moles of chlorine must be consumed in the first reaction to produce 2.25 kilograms of dichloro-difluoromethane in the second step. 
assume all the carbon tetrachloride in the first reaction is consumed in the second. And so when, when I have consecutive reactions like this, um, what I like to do is I just like to cross balance them and then just treat it as one giant equation. I don't add them because I might, that might get me in trouble because for some things you can add, for other things you can't. So I just try to avoid adding in general. And so this is the way we would handle this here. <clears throat> First, I would balance these individually. So here I have one carbon, one carbon, four hydrogens. I'll need four HCLs. And that's going to give me a total of eight chlorines on the product side. And so I'll need four Cl2s on the reactant side. And so that would be balanced. And then I'm going to balance the second one. So I have one carbon, one carbon, four chlorines. I have two chlorines here one chlorine here, so I'm going to double the HCl. That's going to give me two chlorines plus two chlorines. That gives me four chlorines. And then I have two fluorines here. I'm going to double the HF. And so now it's balanced. And so the critical part is this, what we call the intermediate product. The intermediate product is carbon tetrachloride. And the important part is this matches. So I have one mole produced in step one, and then one mole of this produced in step two. So now this is cross-balanced. And so now the, the mole ratio is this. For every one mole of dichloro dichloromethane that's produced, I consume four moles of chlorine. And so this turns out just to be a st basic stoichiometry problem. All I do is go 2.25 kilograms of <clears throat> dichloro dichloromethane. And then I'll convert that to grams, and then I'll go to moles. And then from moles of dichloro dichloromethane, I'm going to go to moles of chlorine. And the mole ratio here is this, 4 moles of chlorine per 1 mole of carbon Cl2F2 dichloro dichloromethane. And then from there, I'm going to go to what do they want this in? How many moles? Oh, then I'm done. So I didn't, don't need to go any farther than this. Eighty-six. Carbon dioxide gas produced in the combustion of a sample of ethane is absorbed in barium hydroxide producing 0.506 grams of barium carbonate. How many grams of ethane must have been burned? So ethane burns producing carbon dioxide gas in reaction one. I should just call it step one. In step two, the carbon dioxide gas is absorbed by the barium hydroxide to make barium carbonate. And so this, these are consecutive reactions here. When I deal with stoichiometry for consecutive reactions, I just cross-balance it between step one and step two. So the first thing is, let's balance the combustion reaction here. Um, balancing the combustion reaction here, actually, I need to copy this to my notes. So a consecutive reaction, I have two carbons, I'll need two CO2s, six hydrogens, I'll need three waters. And that's going to give me four plus three, seven oxygens. I'm going to write seven halves O2 here. That's going to give me seven oxygens. Now, normally what I do is I double this to get rid of the fraction. I don't like using fractions in stoichiometry. But they're not asking anything about the oxygen. All they're asking about is ethane and barium carbonate. And so I'm just going to leave it. The fraction, since I don't have to deal with it. OK, then um, 
this is already balanced, the bottom reaction. But you see, I'm left with, in step one, I'm left with two moles of CO2. And so what I have to do th is this. For step two, I have to make sure that the moles of CO2 produced here is equal to the moles of CO2 consumed here. So I'm going to have to double this equation. So when we have the consecutive reaction now, I'm going to produce uh, two moles of CO2 in the first step and then consume those two moles of CO2. This is the intermediate product in the second step. And then it's cross-balanced. Okay, now uh, we, ha we know we've we produced 0.506 grams of barium carbonate. <clears throat> and so this just turns into a basic stoichiometry problem. 0.506 grams of barium carbonate and then we convert that to moles of barium carbonate. And then from moles of barium carbonate, we go to moles of ethane. I'm just going to spell it ethane like that. And the mole ratio here is one mole of ethane for every two moles of barium carbonate form. And then what do they want? they want? How many grams of ethane? So we'll just go from moles of ethane to grams of ethane. Just by using the molar mass. And then we would be done with this particular problem. Eighty-seven. The following process has been used to obtain iodine from oil brines in California. How many kilograms of silver nitrate are required in the first step for every kilogram of iodine produced in the third step? So this is just a little bit more complicated um, because now we have to cross balance rather than two equations. We have to cross balance three, and so the product, the intermediate product that's formed here, has to balance with the starting material here. So for example, if I form three moles of silver iodide, I need to make sure that I have three moles of silver iodide starting in step two, right? This is the intermediate. And then I have a third step. So whatever moles of iron to iodide I form here, I have to have the same number of moles of starting here. And then I can just do it as a straight stoichiometry problem. Uh, this is another one with three steps. These are consecutive reactions. Here's one with four steps. So this one is not, I mean, all these are the same, basically. Do you see that? And then I come to 91. When a solid mixture of magnesium carbonate and calcium carbonate is heated strongly, carbon dioxide gas is given off, and a solid mixture of magnesium oxide and calcium oxide is obtained. If a 24.00 gram sample of mixture of magnesium carbonate and calcium carbonate produces 12.00 grams of CO2, then what is the percentage by mass of magnesium carbonate in the original mixture? Does that problem kind of sound familiar? And so in this particular example here, we have a 24.00 grams of mix. And in, in this mix, we don't know how many grams of magnesium carbonate there are. No. 
and we don't know how many grams of calcium carbonate there are. And so we, what we want is we want the percentage by mass magnesium carbonate. And so how are we going to do it? Well, the way we're going to do it is we're going to take advantage of the thermal decomposition of magnesium carbonate. When magnesium carbonate is heated, it's a solid, to very high temperatures, what happens is it decomposes into magnesium oxide, which is solid, plus CO2 gas. And the same thing with calcium carbonate. When calcium carbonate is heated, it's going to form calcium oxide plus CO2 gas. Um, the combined CO2, we, we produce 12.00 grams of combined CO2. So how should I do this? Now, this is not a step one, step two. This is simultaneous. So I have both of these in the mixture, and I'm just going to heat it up, and this reaction is going to happen simultaneously. So what should, I, what should I do? Should I add these two equations together? No, that's a big mistake. Do not add these two equations together. Then, then what should I do? Well, this is a problem of what? So we have, you know, algebra, we have dimensional analysis, and we also have, what's that? Yeah, I, I like graphical analysis, but this is a two unknown problem. If we have two unknowns, then we need two equations. You know, what would the two equations be? Well, one might be like x, x plus y equals 24, that's one. Or, um, or something like this. You know, Z plus W grams of CO2 equals 12. Something like that. Or you could do different things. If you don't like the graphical method, then what you would do is you do something like this. <clears throat> you don't add these together. You treat these as two separate stoichiometry problems. And so we could do the two unknown system of equations. And so I'll just say x plus y equals 24.00 grams, where x is, let's do magnesium carbonate, and y is calcium carbonate grams. And then um, we know how the, uh, we know how it reacts. So we know the stoichiometry. So in other words, if I do x grams of, um, magnesium carbonate, then I go to moles of magnesium carbonate, and then moles of magnesium carbonate to moles of CO2, and then moles of CO2 to grams of CO2. It could be one equation. And we'll call this W grams of CO2. And then we'll have um, Y grams of calcium carbonate, and then do the same thing. I guess it's going to go to moles, to moles of CO2, and we'll call this Z grams of CO2 here. And then we, we'll have other equations that we can add in here. So we could do a substitution. So for example, um, Y is equal to 24 minus X. We might substitute that in here. And then W plus Z is equal to 12, so we could figure things out. So eventually what we're going to get this into one variable and then solve for one variable. But I don't like this method. I prefer the graphical method. And so you know what this problem reminds me of? This problem reminds me of magnesium chloride, sodium chloride mixture. Do you remember that problem? The percent chlorine in that. And so in this particular problem, this is what I do. In the graphical method is we assume the mixture is 100% magnesium carbonate. 
and that means all 24.00 grams will be magnesium carbonate. And then we convert that to moles. And then for moles of magnesium carbonate, we get moles of CO2. And from moles of CO2, we get grams of CO2. So we could do that here. What was the molar mass of magnesium carbonate? Magnesium is 24.31. Carbon is 1201. Three oxygens is 4800. That gives us 32. 12, 14. 84.32. 84.32. Thank you. CO2 is 4401. So I'm going to do 24 um, divided by 84.32 times 44. One. It's a one-to-one -one mole ratio. So I'm going to get 12.526 grams of CO2. And then we assume 100% calcium carbonate. And so all 24.00 grams would be calcium carbonate. And then we'll convert that to moles, and then moles of CO2, and then grams of CO2. And so calcium is 40.08. And carbonate was going to be the same, 50.01. So this is going to be 90.09. And so 24 divided by 90.09 times 44.01, 11.72. So the range of CO2 goes from 11.7 to 12.5. And what did we have? We had 12.0. Let's see. Let's make sure I did this calculation right. Did other people get that? 24 divided by, let's see, did I calculate that correctly? Oh, no, I didn't calculate it correctly. It's 60, sorry. Carbonate 60. And therefore, this is 100.09. So 24 divided by 100.09 times 44.01, 10.55. So if this mixture were pure magnesium carbonate, I'd get 12 and a half grams of CO2. If the mixture were pure calcium carbonate, I'd get less. I'd get 10.5, 10.6 grams of CO2. But what I got was 12.00 grams. So that means there's more magnesium carbonate in this mixture because it's closer to 12 and a half. Okay, then what's the next step here? Graph it. So we put in the total grams of CO2 on the Y. And then on the X, we could have different, different ones. Um, on the X, we could have 24.00 grams of magnesium carbonate. What this is, is going to mean that there's zero grams of calcium carbonate. And it's going to be 100% magnesium carbonate. And then we could go down to zero grams of magnesium carbonate. 
which would mean 24.00 grams of calcium carbonate, which means there's 0% magnesium carbonate in this mixture here. And then we'll just add in the data points here. If this were 100% calcium carbonate, 0% magnesium carbonate, then I'd produce 10.55 grams. So over here, I'll just write 10.55 grams of CO2. And then if I have 100% magnesium carbonate, I'm going to produce 12.53 grams of CO2. So we'll just put that up here. Let's do 12.53 grams of CO2. And then graph it. Okay, so then I just figure out the equation of the line. Y is equal to mx plus b, where y is the grams of CO2. M is the slope. The slope here is going to be, what, 12.53 minus 10.55. That's delta y over delta x. Now, delta x, I could either have percent or grams of magnesium carbonate. This particular question is asking for percent. So I'm just going to write it. This is going to be 100% minus 0%. And so the units here for the slope are going to be in grams of magnesium carbonate. Or no, yeah, set. Grams of CO2, sorry. grams of CO2 per percent magnesium carbonate. X is going to be percent magnesium carbonate. And the intercept is going to be 10.55 grams. So what I'll do is I'll just plug in my 12.0 zero grams here and then solve for x. And so I get 12 minus 10.55 equals times 100 divided by 1253 minus 1055. Seventy three point two three per cent. Okay. So I prefer doing the graphical versus stoichiometrically here with the system of equations. You could do it either way. Ninety-two, a mixture of iron three oxide and iron two oxide was analyzed and found to be seventy-two point zero percent iron by mass. What is the percentage mass of iron three oxide in this mixture? And so it's the same thing. I like to do this with a graphical method, so we'll assume the mixture is one hundred percent iron three oxide and calculate the percent iron from that. And then we'll assume the mixture is 100% iron 2 oxide and calculate the percentage iron in that. And then that gives us the range from the low to the high and then figure out where 72% lies. So the exact same problem. This would be very similar to the um, <coughs> magnesium chloride, sodium chloride problem. In there. All right, and then the advanced problems are quite similar, so I don't 
remember too much. Except this is the one I asked you to prepare for when you come to test. This is the same deal. You know, two unknown mixture. And so again, this one, these are simultaneous reactions. We don't combine them. We leave them separate. What a lot of people end up doing is they combine it and fix the ratio. When you combine these, and people will put one iron and two aluminums, that means the mixture always has to be one mole of iron, 55 grams, plus two moles of aluminum. Two moles of aluminum is 20, what, seven, so 54 grams. It would be like 55 or something plus 54. No, the ratio can be anything. We can have any amount of iron in there, any amount of aluminum. It doesn't have to be a one to two mole ratio or whatever mass ratio that comes out to. So we don't combine these two equations, we leave them separate. And then we analyze it each. And so this is keeping you safe. So that's another reason I prefer the graphical method, so that <clears throat> the tendency to combine the equations is, is less lessened. All right, um, any questions on that? So that's some new stuff from So we're going to move on to chapter 5, which deals with reactions. So we're going to review some electrolyte properties first. We have three types of electrolytes, strong, weak, and non. And so what's the difference between strong, weak, and non-electrolytes? Strong, we have um, like 100 or close to 100 percent dissociation. So dissociates slash ionizes about 100 percent. Weak electrolytes only partially dissociate. How late do we go till today? Four. Four? Okay. And non-electrolytes um, don't dissociate. And so let's look at some examples here. And so give me an example of a strong electrolyte. Uh, one example of strong acids. Strong acids are strong electrolytes. So if we pick HCl, HCl occurs as molecules in the gaseous state. And these HCl molecules can dissolve in water to form HCl aqueous. When we have HCl aqueous, do we see HCl molecules dissolved in water? No. And so the first thing we look at is solubility. The next thing we look at is what's dissolved in water. And so this is the electrolyte properties. And since HCl is a strong electrolyte, what we expect to find is H plus and Cl minus. Now H plus, do you know about H plus? H plus is equal to a proton. And a proton is, is very small. I mean, when you look at an atom, let's say a hydrogen atom, it's very big. Well, very big being like 100 to 600 picometers in size. But the, the nucleus is very small. And so the proton inside here is about 1 10,000th the size of the atom. So in other words, it's about 1 10,000th of uh, 100 angstroms, which means it's, it's quite small. 
And um, that small size means it's very reactive. And so even though the charge is not that high, it's going to yield a high charge to size ratio. A high charge to size ratio, I call that a high charge density. Anything with a high charge density is going to be reactive electrically. And <clears throat> chemical reactions are just these electrical interactions. And so what happens is that H plus, which is a tiny proton, um, combines with a water molecule, which is much larger, to form this, H3O plus. So this is much more stable. Free protons are extremely unstable. And so when I write H plus, this is not stable. H plus is immediately going to be attacked, or it's going to attack water. And so if this is aqueous, there's plenty of water around. And so what that means is that H plus does not exist. Instead, H3O plus exists. Because there's going to be a reaction. However, H3O plus is a bit more hassle. And so in chem 1A, I don't bother with H3O plus. In chem 1B, we bother with H3O plus. So in chem 1A, when we're looking at chemical reactions, I'm just going to leave it as H plus. And you should recognize that H plus, because of its high charge density, is quite unstable. But I don't want to have to write H3O plus for every single reaction. And so this would be an example of a consecutive reaction. First, we produce the proton, and second, we produce the hydronium. This happens so quickly, it's, it's just one reaction. Hey, was that reaction called again? Uh, was this reaction called again? Consecutive reaction? Consecutive, yeah. Consecutive. Uh, I mean, it's, this is not a chemical. This is like a physical process here. Essentially, it's consecutive. First, we'll dissociate, and then the H plus will attack. It, it really happens in one step. Because the H2O will attack the proton on the back. It's going to get an entire world with chloride. And H2O is going to be a much better, what we call, base. And we'll react to that. Um, let's do acetic acid next here, and I'll finish with this. If I have acetic acid here, in pure form, it's a liquid. And it's also water soluble, so we can form aqueous acetic acid. But acetic acid is not a strong electrolyte, so only partially dissociates. Yeah. And we'll leave it at that. Okay, so I'll stop here and then we'll continue next time. These uneven arrows here just means it's heavily favored. So it's 99% this, 1% that. Let's just add that here. Yeah, 9.45 a.m. 9.45? Yeah. Okay, and it's until when? 12.50. Okay, perfect. Thank you.